we are standing on holy ground. Thank you, worship team, for doing that for me today. I specifically asked that. I was studying that scripture where um, the Bible says that Moses, when he came into the presence of God, that the Lord told him, take the shoes off of your feet because you are standing on holy ground. Now, the ground was not holy because of Moses. The presence of the Lord in this service today is not because of us, but it's the presence of God. Do you ever wonder why I had to take his shoes off? I mean, think about it. Say, uh, well, uh, maybe they were raggedy and they didn't look good in church. But that, that wasn't the reason. The reason was that Moses, like all others of his day, would make their own shoes. They would sit down and take the materials, whatever it was they used to make the shoes, and they would make their own shoes that fit their own feet. And what God was saying to Moses was, I don't want anything of your creation standing between you and me. I want you to think about it now. We are saved by grace through faith, that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. It's not from your works, lest you would boast. Making your own shoes and standing in the presence of the Lord with them on, you, you got your own works between you and God. But God so wants to be so intimate with us in our lives that he says, take your shoes off. You're in a special place today. We are standing on holy ground every time we come into the presence of the Lord. We may not realize it. I've actually kicked my shoes off before. I'm walking funny because I got my shoes one size too big for me. And I feel like a clown at the circus every time I climb these steps. So if I fall, don't laugh, but do get it on video. I'm going to ask uh, for if for those on the TNS committee who can, right after service, meet with me for just a few minutes. won't take long. Uh, if, if we have a quorum, that means a majority, then we'll go ahead about it. But otherwise, it's in answer to an email I sent you yesterday. Um, did you know that we have the power of God living in us? It's, it's not that he is some stone idol that we bow down and worship before but he is the true and the living God. And we come into his presence. It doesn't have to be here in the church. It can be out on the farm. It can be down on Main Street. It, it can be anywhere that suddenly the presence of the Lord comes over you. I had it happen not, well, it's been a little while ago. I had it happen when um, I was in an elevator at a hospital and this young man had a very small vocabulary. It was mostly filled with F words and D words, and you, you, you can take it out from there. It wasn't Detroit words, but, you know, he was having words. And, and I thought, how foul a mouth is that? Now, there, there was the day when I would have said, boy, shut your mouth. You, you, you don't talk like that around other folks. And I would say he cussed like a sailor, but then that would be an insult to sailors. He, uh, he really had a foul mouth. And so right in the middle of his discourse, I just stopped in that elevator, and it was just him and me, or he and I. Well, it was the two of us. <laughs> and as loud as I could in that confined space, I said, Praise the Lord! I was standing on holy ground. That cat wasn't, but I was standing on holy ground, and you should have seen. He had pushed the button to like floor seven, but he got off on floor six. And I, I thought, well, good enough for you, son. But anyways, um, I want you to know that we will have prayer for, for, for some sick folks. 
at the end of the message today. And I want your faith built as we pray for those among us who have very special and very scary needs. And so we'll have that prayer. And you say, well, why don't you just have, you know, you go to church a lot of time and they'll have prayer for the sick right after the offering or, you know, somewhere in the middle of the service like we do here with the, with the stewardship challenge and the announcements. And they'll say, okay, anybody sick need, need a touch from the Lord today? Well, you know, the Bible says in Romans chapter 10, verse 17, that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So my prayer is in the next little bit that your faith will be built and when you have that need that you bring to God, we will do what the Bible says. We'll call for the elders of the church, we'll anoint you with oil, we'll lay hands on you, and we'll pray the prayer of faith. You know, that's our job, to pray the prayer of faith. But it's God's job because it, to heal them because it says we'll pray the prayer of faith, but the Lord will lift them up. So I knew a guy one time, he said, I know when somebody's sick is going to get healed because my hand starts shaking like this. And I thought, man, this what do you got going on in that hand? And he just out of nowhere, his hand starts shaking. And uh, that could be embarrassing when you do that and lay hands on the sick and they don't get well. So then you think something's wrong. But I want you to know that I'm, I'm going to preach a message on faith this morning. And I'm preaching that message with the clear understanding that we believe that the Bible, even this one held together by duct tape, that the Bible is the Word of God. Everything in this Bible is true. This Bible does not contradict itself. It's, it is the God's Word. It is the roadmap for your life. It, 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 it is the instruction manual for you when something's wrong and for you when everything is right. Remember that. And so faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So if, um, if you could turn your Bibles with me to Romans chapter 10. Uh, oh, I've already done that. To Hebrews chapter 11. It's on the right side of the Bible in the New Testament. And turn to, with me to Hebrews 11 and 1. We're so accommodating in this church we can put scriptures up on the wall so you don't even have to look at your Bible and some people stop carrying their Bibles to church. Well, you know what? You get in a fight, you want a weapon, right? Well, this is my, this is my sword. And I got a little one that fits in my pocket here. That's my pocket knife. But I want you to know that you should always carry your Bible to church. You should always listen to the preacher and make sure the preacher's telling it straight and telling it right. And it does what he says or she says does not confuse you, you can read it for yourself. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, one of my favorite scriptures in the Bible, I don't even have to go to the Bible to read it, I've, I've committed it to my heart. The Bible says that now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Now faith, it says, right now faith. Not faith back when, not faith in the future, but faith right now is the substance of the things that you hope for and the evidence of things you don't see. Now, my friends, there is um, there's another translation of this that I would like to read to you. It's uh, from what's called the Amplified Bible, and it actually makes it a little clearer because you read substance of things hoped for Evidence of things not seen. Well, just what does that mean? Here's how it's written in that Amplified Bible. It says, now faith is the assurance. It's the title deed, proof of ownership, confirmation. Faith is the confirmation of the things that are hoped for, which means they are divinely guaranteed, not by your action, not by my action, but that faith means these things are your divine guarantee. And it is the evidence of things 
not seen. Well, what does that mean, the evidence of things that are not seen? It means the conviction of their reality. Faith comprehends as fact what God cannot be experienced by the physical senses. It's a spirit thing. It's in your heart thing. That faith is guaranteed, the guarantee, the title deed to what you're needing in your life. Romans 4 and 17 says, As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations. Speaking of Abraham. Before him, whom, listen to this, he believed even God who quickens the dead. Then he says, and he calls those things which be not as though they were. So you walk around and you're sick or, or you're in the hospital and you're running through the tests or you're in the, you're in the scanner that is uh, scanning your bones and, and your joints and all of that. And when you, when you are in that place, when you're in there, you have to remember that you call things to be though they be not. So I laid in the, in the cancer radiation. It looked like Star Wars was zapping me all the time. And I laid in it and I quoted, Fear not, for I have redeemed thee, I have called thee by my name, or by thy name. Thou art mine. I belonged to God. And he said, when you go through the waters, I'm going to be with you. You ever feel like a flood has hit you? When you go through the waters, I'll be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. And here, listen to this. And when you walk through the fire, you won't be burned. I quoted that every time. I quoted, now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. And then when I realized that I was battling this cancer, you know, they told me that, but it didn't come to me real good till I was in that machine and I was, I was struggling with the treatments and it was having an effect on me. But I could lay on that table exposed to God and the whole world and all the holy elect angels. I was laying on that table and I began to build faith in my heart. The doctor says I got cancer, I say I don't. When he told me you have cancer and it's not curable, I said the devil is a liar. Then I said, well, you're a pretty nice fellow, Doc, but, but the devil's a liar. And, and I'm going to believe the report of the Lord. Whose report will you believe? I will believe the report of the Lord who says, I am saved, I am healed, I am delivered, I walk in faith, I don't walk in doubt. Are you listening to what I'm saying? Say amen if you are. I put a... Um, I put Facebook posts all the time in these little reels where I talk and, and, and I'm trying my best to get to 10,000 followers and I'm only at 9,730. So follow me on Facebook, it'll be a help. But I posted a little meme yesterday that said, to forsake not the assembling of yourselves together, and even more so as you see the day of the Lord approaching. And so someone wrote and said, what about those of us who are homebound, who you cannot, we cannot go to church? Well, I scrambled for an answer on that one. And you know what I came up with? I came up with, I copied the link to the, <laughs> to the, to the live stream that goes on, and I said, go here tomorrow at 10 o'clock, and, and you can worship with us. And one of them said, the problem is they don't put the words on the screen, and I don't, I don't know uh, what, how to sing along with them. Well, you guys put the words on the screen. That it's the perfect answer. I said, so you can go to that site and you can watch it. And, and, and so I want to thank all of y'all for being here today. I know the machine says you got one listening, two listening. But the good thing about this, you can listen later again and again and again. So I welcome you on the live stream. So let me get into this, that what faith really is. Um, that he calls those things which be not as though they were. The doctor says, you have cancer, it's terminal. The Bible says, I can call things that be not as though they were. 
as they are. The healing is not on your part, it's on God's part. Your part is obedience to the word. Call for the elders of the church, let them anoint you with oil, lay hands on you and pray the prayer of faith and the Lord will raise you up. I want to tell you what faith does. Faith dissolves doubt. You say, well, how in the world does faith dispel doubt? I'll tell you a little story. It's kind of cute that uh, I've, told, I've told so much my wife could probably quote me on it. And I'm good long as I don't quote Hebrew or Greek because she's going to shake her head and say, who cares? Just talk in English. But anyway, there was two farmers and their property was adjoined by a fence and to keep their animals in. And so every Saturday morning, these two farmers would meet at a certain spot at the fence and they'd talk about their week and talk about what's coming on. Well, one of the farmers was an eternal optimist. He saw the glass half full. He never saw the glass half empty. He, he saw the good in everything. He refused to see the bad in anything. Well, the other guy was an eternal pessimist. He didn't agree with anything. You could say, let's go get ice cream. He'd say, I'm again it. Well, let's, let's, let's go down to the feed store. They got popcorn. I, I don't know. If, I don't, I've never been to a feed store. Whatever they got down there, they're giving away. and We'll go get some of that. Some of that. And the uh, first rule to preaching is never talk about something you don't know what you're talking about. So forget the feed store line. Let's go back and get some ice cream. But the, but the pessimist was never happy about anything. I know my ice cream. Butter, pecan, oh, my goodness. But anyway... You dip potato chips in them too. Oh, you get salty and sweet. But but this they would meet there, and so the optimist he bought he had a he had a boat and he liked to duck hunt. He was like those duck dynasty guys, you know. He just lived to hunt ducks. He said, "Hey, listen, I got a new dog that is amazing, and you need to see my dog in action." And the pessimist said. Well, I don't know. I, we probably won't even see a duck. He said, well, just go with me and ride in the boat. He said, well, is, is the boat sturdy? Will it stand up to two of us in the boat? The optimist says, absolutely. It's, it's a real good bass boat. I got it, Bass Pro. I mean, it'll, it, and it's under warranty. And so the pessimist says, well, I'll go with you this one time, but don't expect this to happen on a regular basis. So they made the appointment to go duck hunting. So the optimist said, as they were, they were in their duck blind, the optimist said, man, I think it's going to be a great day. And the pessimist said, we probably won't even see a duck. And the optimist said, you just hold on because I want you to see how my dog Blue works in this. And so, sure enough, here come a here come a, fl a flock of, I guess they're called a flock. Is it called a flock? Yeah, hallelujah. Got some duck hunters. Didn't mess that one up. But this, he said, here comes a flock right now. And they're, 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 in, they're in order. And you can shoot one of them. And the pessimist says, well, I'll probably miss. And the optimist said, no, you won't. I put a good scatter shot in that. You'll hit one for sure. And the pessimist said, no, I don't think I will. And the optimist says, well, just shoot. And the pessimist just raised the gun like this and bang. Well, you know what happened? He hit one. Not even trying, he hit one. And that duck took a nose dive into the water. And the optimist thought, this is the moment I've been waiting for 10 years for. He said, Blue, go get him. And he looked at the pessimist and he said, watch this. That dog, a black lab, by the way, old blue, he jumped out of the boat and he walked on top of the water. He picked up that duck without messing it up. He turned around and he walked on top of the water back to the boat, jumped in the boat and laid the duck at the feet of the pessimist. Well, the optimist said, I got him now. 
He said, well, neighbor, what do you think about that? And the pessimist thought a minute, and then he looked at the optimist, and he said, he can't swim, can he? <laughs> so I love that story because even when you prove something to people, even when you hear a testimony of a healing, you hear a testimony of God providing when there was no provision, even in those moments, listen to me, there are some people that will have doubt, but I guarantee you that faith will dissolve every doubt in your mind when God moves on the scene. While we're to be filled with faith, it's too easy to doubt. And you know what causes it? We doubt because we look at the circumstances around us. And I want to tell you something right now that I have learned in my 60, almost 68 years of life. I have learned through being a law enforcement officer, through the eyes of a soldier, through, through 40 plus years of ministry, I have learned something. And here's what I've learned. I've learned that life is not fair. It's not. And sometimes, no matter what you do, it turns out wrong. And people say, well, you're just a big loser. You know, my eight-year-old looked at me one day and did like this, and I thought, well, that's so 2001. But anyways, it meant loser. But, but you, <laughs> when, you, when you look at life, you understand that life is not fair, and God does not make sense sometimes. Why does he take one and leave the other? Why, why does he do that? What you, when, when you lose a child, you have to wonder, my God, what have I done? What, what has, why has this come on me? This is not fair. God, you should have. And my mother used to say to me when I would come in just stoned and drunk while I was the police, I would come in at night and, and I, would, I would go to, she would be sitting there in her rocking chair with her big white King James Bible with a big letter edition and all the pictures, you know, a beautiful Bible. And that Bible was, the, the pages were odd because they were stained with tears, especially in those faith parts. And my mother would say, come here, boy, sit down, I want to talk to you. And I'd say, I don't want to talk to you, Mom. You're going to get on that kick again about church. She said, boy, sit down. Well, you know what? Even when you're a grown man, you need to listen to your mama. The best thing you can ever do in your life is listen to your mama. She's been there, done that, got the T-shirt. It may not say Lakeside on it, but she's got the T-shirt. She'd sit me down. And she'd open that Bible and she'd start reading about heathens and, 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 and what the place in fire. And I, I remember once she would quote out of Psalms, the wicked shall be cast into hell and all nations that forget God. And then she'd get on uh, verses about hell and how bad it is. And she, she would just wore me out. Well, you know what happens after you hear that enough? You get hardened to it. But one day she got my attention. And she said, listen to me. When you were a baby, I gave you back to the Lord. And you may think you're going to end up like your brother did. My brother died at 24 years old. And, and he was a, a drunk and he used drugs and he slept around. And, and he, she said, I refuse to let you turn out like your brother did. She said, I gave you to God and you're going to serve God one day. You may not want to do it right now, but the day's going to come. You're going to serve God. She said, well, the first words you said as a baby, you preached. And she said, you started, you acted like the preacher at church. And may I be a little crude? Would you all forgive me if I am? But she said, you were standing there in your diaper and nothing but your diaper. And you had a, one hand down the back of your diaper and the other hand up in the air preaching about God saving sinners. I don't do that anymore. But, but, but there was the time. 
But my mother told me God has a plan for your life. And I want you to tell your lost loved ones that, that, that seem like they can't never get it right. And you may be sitting here this morning, one of those people that you think life is not fair and you, don't, you, you want to believe, but it seems like every time you try, it doesn't work. Well, I'm here to tell you, when you have faith, it will work. And faith does not come by anything but by the hearing of the word of God. It says you can be healed, you can be delivered, you can be set free. Are you listening? to me you can go to heaven and not to hell you can live a life in abundance the thief comes to steal kill and destroy but God said Jesus came to give you life and to give you life more abundantly so life is not fair and sometimes God doesn't seem to make sense. So what we do is we approach almost every situation with a negative and a pessimistic attitude. And you know what? People like that, they usually fall. They usually fail. And why? They fall, they fall because in a faith-filled world, doubters never succeed. Remember when you were a kid, they told you um, how did it go that um, uh, frowners never win and winners never frown or something like that? Thank you. Listen to them. They got it right. But a walk with God that is filled with faith is optimistic. A walk with God by faith it looks for the good in people and expects the best from them. And without an extra expectation, I have to get back here and get in the position. I don't know what you did, son, but you it's your job to watch that door, okay? I want to tell you that because of my secular life in my earlier years, it is sometimes hard to see the best in people and the best in situations. It causes you to be cynical and negative because everybody you stop or everybody that you deal with in an investigation, you approach them with the understanding they're going to lie to you. And so what you have to do is you have to break them down a little bit at a time until you catch them in a lie, and then you say, you lied there, are you lying now? When are you telling the truth, then or now? And you know my favorite one, do you still beat your wife? Well, there's no right answer for that. If he says yes, he claims he's a wife beater. If he says no, he claims he's a wife beater. So, so you would do that to people to get to the truth. Y'all follow what I'm saying about that? You can buy them shirts at Walmart, $5.97, no sleeves right there. Y'all might try selling some of them with legs out on it. <laughs> I guarantee you my redneck friends would buy it. But those early years caused me to be cynical. And being cynical caused me to be negative. But you know what we must understand? We must understand that all things work together for the good of those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. You may not understand. You may not understand, but you have to trust in God. You can never believe that man is going to always get it right, but God never fails. We have troubles all around us. I'm talking about faith dissolves doubt. We have troubles all around us, but we're not defeated. We do not know what to do, but we do not give up the hope of living. We are persecuted, but God does not leave us. We are hurt sometimes, but we are not destroyed, according to 2 Corinthians 4 and 8 through 10. And then 
The scripture says in 2 Corinthians 4 and 18, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. We try to imagine heaven, but there are things that we, we, we haven't seen. So in, in that we haven't seen, how can you believe in something you haven't seen? Well, by faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And the word of God says you will live and not die. The word of God says I'll make you the head and not the tail. The word of God says when the devil comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord will raise up a standard against him. That's faith. Secondly, faith dispels dread. This is why Paul could say at the end of his journey, knowing he's facing death, they're going to behead him in Rome. They're going to kill him. He knows it's coming. The sentence has already been made. And you know, Paul took it a step further. He was a full-blown Roman citizen, and they were violating the law to even put him in jail. But he was in jail, and while he was in jail... He wrote several of the epistles in the New Testament. While he was in jail, he witnessed to those that were in jail. Sometimes when we're in a rotten place, it's because God is trying to do a work in us and through us. When we're in that rotten place, he gives us the opportunity to have faith in him and lead others to saving knowledge in Christ. Faith dispels dread. Did you know today's world is terrifying? My, my little grandchildren, the schools are teaching them, and this is in another county, the schools are teaching them that global warming is going to burn up the earth and, and, and we're all going to be toast because it's going to be so hot we can't live. They're taught that evolution is a fact when in reality, evolution is a theory. It's not a fact. But God's word says, in the beginning, God. And you can hold on to that. But my, one of my granddaughters came to me and said, Papa, they keep saying that this is going to happen and the whole earth is going to be destroyed. And my answer to that, to what, 12-year-old Maddie, 13-year-old, my answer to Maddie was this. I said, honey... God has reserved judgment of this earth for himself. He promised he is going to bring judgment to this earth. And it's not global warming. And I said, it's not even real science. Oh, come on now. I, I know people are not supposed to talk like this. They say you're woke and everything else. Well, I'm awake. I'm not woke. I'm awake. And I'll put it to you this way. The lies that are being peddled, that a little boy can turn into a little girl, a little girl can turn into a little boy. Whatever you were born at birth is what you are. And I think there's a fad going around to corrupt the young people of this world. And imagine the next generation when you don't even know. Somebody said, well, what's your... Somebody actually asked me, what's your preferred pronoun? I said, me, my, mine, he, his. And if you say it's, it's, it's us and them, I'm going to just take it. You got a devil in you, and I'm going to cast the devil out of you. Amen? Is that all right? I hope they don't block the video now. Because this is good preaching. You say, why do you say that? Well, because it's a poor frog that don't croak for his own pond. The world is messed up. It's terrifying. My little Henry, my two-year-old, I know I'm taking a little extra time this morning, but I got something to say. My little, we, my daughter and her husband went to Jamaica last week. So I had eight-year-old Kai and two-year-old Henry at my house for seven days. And I know now why the young people have babies, why the old folks don't. 
of what we did to get even because we didn't go to Jamaica, I spoiled that two-year-old so bad that Mama's going to have a time. I hope she thinks about Jamaica when he does to her or, or, my, or my son-in-law like he did me. I, I, had a, I had a day when I got in bed about midnight. I had to get up at 3 a.m. So after I did what I had to do at 3 a.m., uh, taking them to the airport, I just stayed awake the rest of the day. I had work I had to do. So about four in the afternoon, I laid down on the bed, and I thought, my wife said, take a nap, and I'll wake you up uh, in, in time for the five. Well, so it was three maybe I laid down because I like that show that I watch it every day when I can. So here comes little Henry. Little Henry's uh, other grandmother is Korean, and he has... Korean blood, and he has Scottish blood in him. And so that's a combination. I mean, think of Braveheart. Think of William Wallace, you know, with his kilt and everything, doing Taekwondo <laughs> on, the, on the long shanks. But so he comes in, and he knows how to work the television, like an expert at two years old. He turns the TV on. He goes over to that where you got channels that are not on your cable system, but I guess they're free channels. And he goes right straight to one that is the wrestling channel, the WWE. And I mean, it's brutal. They're flying down, breaking chairs and breaking tables and slinging them over the top rope and through the middle ropes. And so what Henry does, he stands up in the middle of the bed and he pulls his T-shirt off. Then he takes his pants off, and he's only in a diaper. He backs up to the other corner of the bed, and it's a king-size bed, and he takes off running toward me, and he bounces up in the air and comes down on me with the elbow like the wrestlers do. I thought, my Lord, son, those bony arms. But, but he... He got back up and he turned around and did a flying whatever it was and he twisted in midair and fell on me. I didn't get any sleep that day. But I tell you this, Henry's having a hard time developing his word because this mask requirement during his early years when he was learning to talk, you need to see people's whole face to learn well. You need to see the whole thing. And then after all this pandemic was over, they said, well, the masks don't really work. But you know what they do? They thwart growth in children. It made them out of school and not able to make relationships in the formative years. But we get afraid of another pandemic coming our way. You know what this morning is? The fear of the finance uh, world, a collapse of the financial system. Because the Silicon Valley Bank, you know, they, when, when, when the equities, when the stocks were not doing good, they bought bonds, which is good thinking. Because when stocks go down, bonds go up. But then they started raising interest rates and they didn't pay attention. And as the stocks went back up, the bonds went down and they couldn't sell them for as much as they bought them. And it put them in upside down position. That's exactly what happened. And because they had other regional banks that they worked with, those regional banks are in trouble now. I bank at Regions. It was down how much percent? 11% over the weekend. It went down 11%. And so people look at that, and some may have no knowledge of what the Dow, the NASDAQ, or the S&P 500, they, they have no idea, but they look at the TV and it says, the Dow is down 400 points today. It's dropped 2%. This is the worst drop since the Great Depression. And, and we haven't gotten there yet. But it's the worst drop since 2006, 2007. And, and, and you don't even know what that means because you've never studied economics. But you don't even know what it means when the Dow drops 400 points. What it means is put your money in NASDAQ. But anyway... You see that and you think, oh my, I see it, and I'm supposed to retire August 31st. 
and, and we sold our home, so we're looking to buy another house. And, and we've, we, we haven't even determined what community we're going to live in. But, you know, we just need the right house for the right price. But as you get to that point and you start looking at your 401Ks and your 403Bs that you've been saving since you were in your 20s, it makes you start wondering when maybe when I say see you later, you see me at Walmart shaking hands and greeting people. That's the ideal job for my wife. I need to be buried at Walmart so she'll visit me. But this financial system's in trouble, and especially as you get older, you worry about that. You watch every report. You read every report. I used to teach accounting and business law at a college in Indiana. And, and so I, I learned some of these things, what they look like. But things have changed to the point I don't understand half of it anymore. But I want to tell you something. While we're worried about that, you've got a war going on in, in Ukraine that you think they're going to start shooting nuclear weapons off and, and we're just all going to be burned up in a holocaust of nuclear weapons. We dread it because our health may be failing. One thing I learned in life, can I give you all some older age advice? Don't buy a pair of shoes that's one size too big for your feet because you think you're getting a good deal. Pay the extra $2 and a half and buy your size. But we worry about our health. And as we get to grow older, what we do is we find out that our security blankets are suddenly jerked away from us. And so when you hear these signs, you see these things in the world, in the economy that you don't really understand, what better time is it to lean on the faith of God who says, David said, I was young and now I'm old, but I've never seen the righteous forsaken or his, their seed begging for bread. He said, I will supply all your needs through his, listen, all your needs through his, his glory, through his power. And I believe he's got more money than the Vatican. That's a lot of money. So faith dispels the dread of what we see going on around us. But you know what? Faith does not dispose of the awareness of possibilities, but it dispels the dread of them. I can tell you right now with all I've watched on the on the news and the financial shows and the, read the financial articles, I'm not a bit afraid because my source is not Raymond James. My source is not the Social Security Administration, the Pyramid Scheme Social Security System. My hope is in the Lord God himself who ever lives to make intercession for you and for me. Faith dispels dread you know that faith calms a raging rolling sea so that it can be so peaceful that Jesus could lay in the bottom of the boat and sleep through the storm because he had faith and if faith can stop a rolling sea a raging storm disquieted hearts and minds of those who are trusting in him God can restore you and God can make you remember to quote no weapon formed against me shall prosper and every tongue that speaks against me I will be able to condemn it because this is the heritage of the servants of the Lord it's faith that brings that now I'm on the way home here, kids, uh, young folks. <laughs> you call them but babies. They got babies, and you call them young folks. Faith disarms defeat. 
I come home with this, I'm almost done. Mark 9, 23 says, All things are possible to him that believes. Did I ever tell you the story about a little boy in Montana named Jimmy? little boy in Montana named Jimmy, 10 years old. His mom came to the preacher and said, I'm worried about Jimmy, Pastor. Will you talk with Jimmy? And the pastor said, what's wrong with Jimmy? His mama said, Jimmy lies. He lies. Everything he tells is a big lie. And the pastor said, well, what, what do you mean? He said, well, he said the other day that he caught a 100-pound rainbow trout over there in the Yellowstone. And we know there's no 100-pound uh, trout like that in the Yellowstone. So I asked him, what did you do with it, Jim? He said, oh, I, I just, I left it for the animals. I left it up on the bank so the, so the animals that scavenge can have something to eat tonight. I just wanted to be a blessing to the other animals. He says, well, Jimmy, no. he says, well, send Jimmy by my house. And she said, oh, pastor, you need to know one more thing. He said he killed a 10-point buck with his pocket knife. He said he climbed a tree, put his knife between his teeth, jumped out of that tree on the back of that buck, and rode him and cut his throat while he was running. He said, well, what did you do with it? Well, I gave it to a hunter that didn't get anything today. So the pastor says, send Jimmy by my house tomorrow about uh, 10 o'clock. Now, the pastor, most pastors have some psychological training. <laughs> if they don't have psychological training, they got psychological problems so they can relate to what's going on. And so... This little Jimmy comes to the parsonage, knocks on the door. There's a screen door, a hallway, and the pastor's office. The pastor said, come in, Jimmy. I want to talk to you. So now with this psychology training, he's going to use reverse psychology to cure Jimmy. So Jimmy walks in strong, squared his shoulders, chest out, little chicken chest sticking out. And he said, sit down, Jimmy. Y'all still with me? This white noise will put you to sleep if you're not careful. In fact, I think I dozed off once or twice already. <laughs> but, but the pastor says, sit down, Jimmy. He said, Jimmy, your mom tells me about you caught a hundred pound rainbow trout over in the Yellowstone. Yep, I sure did. Well, your mom told me about the 10-point buck that you killed. Yeah, I sure did. Pastor says, here's the reverse psychology. Jimmy, I want to tell you something. Yesterday, I was sitting here in my office and I heard an office, office carrying on outside. I got up and I walked down to that screen door and I looked out and there was the biggest grizzly bear you ever saw in your life. That grizzly bear walked up the front steps reached up with his paw and ripped my, street, my screen door off and he come down the hall and just about the time he was right at my office this little chalupa dog, little chihuahua comes out of nowhere starts yapping and the bear stands up on his hind legs and that, so that little dog ran up his stomach and grabbed him by his carotid artery and hung on and bit and rode that thing down. Killed him right there in the hall. That little chalupa dog. He said, Jimmy said, wow. And the pastor said, you believe that? Yes, sir, pastor. I believe that. He said, oh, you haven't. Pastor said, you haven't heard those stories. That little dog backed up and started pushing that bear down the hallway. Turned around, grabbed him, started pulling him took him out the door, down the steps, got out in front, he, he left the bear, he jumped off, and he started digging a hole, a big hole. He was just really going after it. 
And then he pushed that bear over in that hole, got up on that pile of dirt and covered him up and sat on top of it and smiled at him. Jimmy, do you believe that? Yes, sir, I believe that. And the pastor frustrated says, Jimmy, how can you believe it? You believe that a grizzly bear came in this house and that little chihuahua dog killed him, drug him out, buried him. You believe that? And Jimmy said, yes, I believe that. He said, how can you believe such? He said, because that was my dog. <laughs> Talk about faith disarming defeat. My friends, can I just, I'm just going to be honest with you. Too often we give up too easily. We get caught up in the things of the world that even coming to church can be a drudgery. But we do it because we know it's the right thing to do. And we do it because maybe our wife makes us go. Or maybe the husband shames the wife into going. Maybe during football season, when the Packers are doing so good, go Pack, go. I can say I went to church and got booed right in the middle of my sermon. That's all right. Wait, wait till the fall. But you know what? Sometimes we give up too easily because we're so caught up in the world. We're caught up in the way the world does things. Did you know, I, I believe that in 2023 that people that go to church will watch things on their television. Now, I'm not off on the one I dealt with, okay? But they will watch things on television that 10, 20 years ago would embarrass the life out of them. But because it came gently and it came slowly over time, the things that you once rejected, you now accept. Have you noticed how the commercials have changed? They'll be selling some product and two men will be on the beach kissing. Have you noticed how they are? Two women will be trying out a purse. Have you noticed how it's gone? It's conditioning your mind. Little by little by little. And isn't it interesting that Jesus said, it's the little foxes that spoil the vine. Now I'm still coming home with this. It's a long way home. The lack of faith to keep holding on to the principles of holiness has caught up with the church. Faith is never defeated. Sometimes there's delays, but faith, faith is never defeated. We have to wait patiently for God's time and God's way. The little boy said, Lord, give, give me patience and give it to me right now. We're like that sometimes. But you know something? And we fight the good fight of faith by doing God's work of spreading the gospel, giving a hand to those who are cast down, giving a hand up to those that are disheartened, encouraging those in your life. My final thoughts. According to Romans chapter 10, verse 13, there is no death for those who repent of their sins and accept Christ. You simply go out of this, it's like going through a door. Your door is here, you're in this life. God sends his angels to bring you home. They meet you at the door. And as you walk through that door into eternity, it's when it all begins. And the angels of God will carry you into the presence of of the Lord and people are afraid of that moment because they've never experienced that moment before they don't want to leave their family they worry about how their family is going to be taken care of 
when the loved one passes through that. But that loved one, you know, I, I think about l little ladies in the church that maybe their, their husbands had died some years before. They never remarried. And every son, I had some when I was a pastor in Indiana. They'd take the little offering envelopes. You know, they had a church flag on them and had these little blocks you could fill out. And when they get their Social Security check, they'd put 10% of that Social Security for tithe. And then they'd give $5 to the youth, $5 to, what, to the women's missions, $5 for the pastor's love offering. They, they, would, they would do that, and they were faithful every Sunday. As they got older, they bent, they began to bend. Their stature began to bend. Their hair turned white. And you say to them, why, why don't you get a perm? Why don't you, why, 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 why is your hair so white? Well, it's because I'm getting ready to bow down into the presence of the king. Why do you stoop over? Why do you bend? because I'm going to lay before the Lord. You can barely walk, but you keep going. You use a walker, but when I get to that door, I won't need that walker anymore. I won't need that cane anymore. And I'll be in the presence of God. I'll be in the presence of all the angels, the cherubim and the seraphim, who cry, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. When we accept Christ as Savior and Lord, we don't need to fear death. Jesus said, whoever believes in me, though he lives, he will never die. And if he dies, he will live again. That's a picture of the rapture. The dead is in Christ, and those which are alive are arising at the same time. I want to give you a personal witness, and then we're going to have the team come back and... Um, would you, would you do holy ground again? And they're going to come back, and I'm going to ask for people to that need a touch from God. You're sick and you're scared. You have, you have a problem. You're going through something you don't know how to get out of. I'm going to ask you at that time to come forward, and our ministry team is going to pray for you. I want to tell you a story. My dad came to the Lord late in life. My dad had um, he he was a he became a preacher, pastored a little church in Bedford, Indiana, right down the street from Indiana University in Blo in uh, Bloomington. Then he pastored a little church that was once a schoolhouse, and he had six people. And I could tell you funny stories, but the one thing I want to tell you is my dad was faithful. The overseer called and said, I don't have anybody to come to your church, so I'm going to have to close the church. And though my dad was sick and wanted to retire, he said, no. He said, everybody deserves a pastor. And he said, that if they want to go to church, they need somebody there to preach to. My dad got sick. Ended up in the hospital and was told by the doctor, your heart is only pumping 15%. My dad said, could it be there's something growing in that? That's reaching out for hope. And the doctor said, no, no, you just you don't have much time left. And you need to talk to your family. That cocky doctor started out the door, and I got between him and the door. And I said, Doctor, I want to talk to you about your bedside manner. I said, all that man wants is a little hope. And you took his hope away from him. He said, I'm sorry. Maybe because I was bigger and imposing. He said, I'm sorry. But he went back to my dad. He said, we'll run a few more tests. We'll see what can be done. Nothing could be done spent Christmas in the hospital asked me to bring my banjo to play 
And we sat in there and we sang Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound to save the wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I can see. Dad started crying. We got to the verse that says, When, when we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise. You know that, you know that verse? And my dad lit up. And then we sang that verse that talks about the trials and the tribulations. Through many pains we've gone. Pain, I can't remember exactly. Through many pains and fears we've gone. We all began to cry. I stopped playing the banjo. A few days later they released dad and I went back to, came back to Tennessee to Kingsport where I was pastoring at the time. It was like a six-hour drive. We were having dinner with one of the church members in their house. And uh, one of the other members called and said, Brother McKinley, honey, I'm, it was an older woman, honey, I'm sorry, but your father has passed away. That's the moment you need. That's the moment it can't be faked. That's the moment it has to be real. When I got home, I drove. I drove the five, five and a half hours through the mountains across Kentucky. And when I got there, my mom said, he was calling for you, son. It broke my heart. I said, what happened? She said he was laying in the bed and he looked up and he saw a light. He saw a light in the room and said, he looked up and he said, oh God, and he died. He took in a breath here. He exhaled it in the presence of God. The angel, my mother was over him saying, Tommy, God's coming to get you. Jesus is going to come himself to get you. He promised. So, so just follow it. And Dad died. When we went to his funeral, I'm sorry. When we went to his funeral, I preached his funeral. And when we got to the graveside, my dad told me, he said, there's only two things I want you to do, boy. He said, um, I want you to reach over and touch my body in that casket, and I want you to raise your other hand and say, praise God, he's made it. I did what he asked. And then I completed his other request at the graveside. I sang. Go down yonder, Gabriel. Put your foot on the land and see. But don't you can't remember, I went blank. Until you hear from me. Oh, meet me, Jesus, meet me. Meet me in the middle of the air. If these wings should fail me, Lord, well, I won't need another pair. Because ain't no grave going to hold my body. Body down, ain't no grave gonna hold my body down. And when I hear that trumpet sound, I'm gonna get up out of the ground. Cause ain't no grave gonna hold my body down. 
That's a song of faith. That's a song that says, I made it. That's a song that allowed us to say, thank God he made it. Shortly after this, and uh, if, if the team will start making your way up here. I've talked to you about faith. That faith dissolves our doubts. Faith dispels our dread. Faith disarms defeat. And faith destroys death. My mother, who was with my dad there, about a month later, was it a month? Two months? A year. My mother had a sudden stroke, set of strokes. She went blind. She had the most beautiful blue eyes. She was the Irish side of the family. Red hair in, in her early days. Red hair before turning white. And bright, beautiful eyes. My mother had a hard childhood. Her mother died when she was three years old. So, my grandfather, a coal miner working, never saw the daylight. Went in in a dark time, came out after dark, would come home, clean up, eat a little bit, and go back to bed and do the same thing the next day. They bought their goods at the company store so they never got ahead. Whatever he made from digging coal, the store got it because he had to feed a big family. The woman that he married was not good to my mother. This little baby lost her mom at three years old, but the stepmother was not good to my mother. She would bring her kids to sit at the table. And my, my mother had uh, 11 sisters and one brother. they would be made to wait until this woman's six kids got their breakfast, their supper and then if anything was left my mother and her brothers and sisters got to eat it was like they were waiting on crumbs on the table one time my mother got in trouble in the middle of the night because when my granddad came in she was hiding in a corner, had a jar of raw mustard and was eating mustard all by itself because that was all she could find. And she was so hungry. Mom had a hard childhood. She was abused. She lost a child at birth. My brother died at 24. The stroke made her go blind she lived the last months of her life because she went into a coma. She was in this coma for how long? Almost a year. She was being fed by a tube in her stomach. They would put these bags up and that would give her the nutrients that she needed, but she was basically lifeless. Did you know in that year, my mother all that life, a child of the Great Depression and everything else that happened in her life. She opened her eyes three times in that year. In that year, she said the same thing, exactly the same thing to three different people. With all that life, she had lived. said the same thing. God's been good to me. I want you to think about that for a minute. When you're dreading, when you worry about death, there's more stories we could tell about those who saw an angel at the time of their death. They saw the presence of the Lord in some other physical way. We could tell stories all day of that to build faith. 
when that moment comes, nobody can go with you. You've got to do it all yourself. But you know what? You don't have to be afraid. You don't have to fear when that happens. I had a cousin, G.A. Wilson, George Albert Wilson. I saw him, and the last time I saw him alive, I said, how you doing, cousin? He said, well, I'm fixing to go to heaven. He said it so plain, so clear. And then he died, and he went to heaven. It's appointed unto men to die. And after that is judgment. Judgment for the things you did and why you did them. Because if you're saved, you will not suffer. The, you'll suffer the loss of the things you did for the wrong reason, but you'll be saved in the presence of the Lord. So here's my question. Has your faith been wobbling a little bit? Has your faith been difficult lately? You having a hard time believing even? Life is unfair. Not fair. It's full of trouble. It's full of sorrow. One more song. I'd rather live in a deep dark cave and know that my poor soul was saved than to live in this world in a house of gold and deny my God and lose my soul. No matter how hard it is in this life, heaven is glorious. No pain, no suffering, no dying, no separation. We'll see our loved ones again. Those that have died in the faith, what a great and a grand reunion that's going to be. But to see.